encourage you to share photographs and content of the session via social media. Our Twitter handle is at ZJaipur Literature Festival, hashtag ZJLF. Welcome to the 10th ZJaipur Literature Festival, Samvat. We are delighted to introduce session 100, The Incredible History of India's Geography, sponsored by Dainik Bhaskar Group. We have Sanjeev Sanyal take us on a journey through India's history through its rich and varied geography. Let's have him on stage. Let's have him share lesser known facts about India and its incredible history. Please welcome on stage Hindol Sen Gupta and Sanjeev Sayal. Over to you, gentlemen. No? Okay, now maybe. Yeah, okay, done. Yeah? Okay. Okay, great, lovely. I'm absolutely delighted to be here, not just because I'm anchoring this panel, but also because I'm with a very dear friend of mine, uh, an older brother, I would say, and also somebody who I really look up to in the kind of writing he does, the kind of great tenacity of research that he brings into his project. And he's really broken new ground, Sanjeev has, in his many books, in trying to explain to us why on earth or what on earth, should I say, does it mean to be Indian? Please, a round of applause for Sanjeev Sanyal. We're going to discuss some of his work through the lenses of this book that he wrote on the history of India's geography. Now, of course, he's taken that theme in many other books that he's written since then. Uh, the Ocean of Churn, of course, is the latest book that he's written, very well received. That also takes forward that, you know, that, that line of thought, so to speak. So I want to begin by asking Sanjeev, Tell me, why on earth should we, uh, we do know today why we should be concerned about the history of India and the debates and the fights therein. Why should we be concerned about geography? Well, my interest in the history of geography or the geography of history um, and why I write about it uh, is partly out of revenge. You see, like many people here, I was subjected to textbooks about um, Akbar's Mansabdari system and the Morley Minto reforms of 1909 and other such really dreary stuff. Um, and um, I had to suffer them through ICSC and so on. Uh, but then, unlike many of you, I thought, uh, you know, why should, why should we not strike back? So having grown up um, and having discovered that actually there's much more to history and both and geography, um, than um, what is there in the textbooks, uh, I decided to begin collect information. In fact, initially I was just doing it for fun. And over time it occurred to me that actually many of these silos of uh, knowledge, whether it's history or geography or commerce and economics and so on, they have been siloed out um, maybe for teaching purposes, but in fact they're all completely interrelated to each other and they are largely meaningless if you do not Take, uh, take that into account. So for example, say in research, an interdisciplinary approach. Absolutely. The world we live in is not siloed. It, you know, history affects geography, geography affects commerce, commerce affects human behavior and migration, uh, and so on and so forth. So what I want try to do through my writings, and I, not just in my uh, popular writings uh, in, in uh, writing history and so on, but even in my professional life as an economist, is to connect all these things through. So, yes, hence the history of geography or the geography of history, whichever way you prefer. So tell us, in all the years that you have worked on this theme of understanding India's history of geography, what is that one big thing that we knew as truth, which you later discovered to be a lie, which startled you? Oh my God, that's going to take me a long, long time. But let me give you one example of something that uh, did startle me. One of them is that you see we have this history of Ashoka that we have. He's a great uh, emperor and that uh, 
you know, almost every textbook, or in fact, TV serials also go on about how he became, uh, after the Kalinga War, became a pacifist and a Buddhist. So, researching my previous book, which was a maritime history, which was of the Indian Ocean, I decided that, you know, why don't I look at this whole episode from the perspective of the people of Odisha. So I began digging up the information on this and it turned out uh, that the whole history of uh, Ashoka becoming a pacifist is actually based on very thin evidence, in fact, mostly made up. Um, and in fact, there is more than adequate evidence of him carrying out major massacres uh, after the Kalinga War. In fact, there's a Sri Lankan chronicle called Ashoka Vadana, which clearly mentions uh, that he carried out these major massacres of, Asho of Jains, um, in another case, another uh, group called the Ajivikas, uh, who he massacred 18,000 of them in one shot and so on. Uh, and uh, oddly enough, our history books simply don't mention all of this stuff. Um, even worse is the fact that the uh, people of Odisha didn't really forget this. Uh, so there's a king called Kharavela. Again, many people have, uh, don't know about Kharavela, but he was one of the great kings of India, not just of, of Odisha. And Kharavela has left us a uh, inscription in a place called Hathi Gumpha that is just outside of Bhuvaneshwar where he mentions that I, Kharavela, went to Magadh and I defeated them and made the king of, uh, of, the, of, the, of uh, Pataliputra, the last Mauryan king, bend to me. And he puts this up, interestingly, in front of a cave called Hathi Gumpha. But if you go to actually see this, and that's why geography matters such a lot, if you go to see this out uh, at Hathi Gumpha, just outside Bhubaneswar, and you climb up the hill, and you stand in front of this inscription, and you just turn around, what do you see? You see another hill. And on that hill is Ashoka's own inscriptions. So what is happening here? What is happening is that Kharavela is telling Ashoka that I, Kharavela, destroyed your kingdom. I went to Pataliputra. I made your descendant bend to me. I brought back the Jain idols that you had taken away from us. Um, and uh, as I said, if you do not know the geography of that place and see it, you cannot believe how these two great emperors are speaking to each other at that spot. Fascinating. Tell me, the other thing that really interests me is this idea that we know a lot of our history through inscription. Yes. Right? And, um, and we know a lot of the history of our geography also through inscriptions. Right? Yeah. Now, isn't it true that inscriptions and the reading of inscriptions, it all depends on how you read them? who has read them, at which time they have read them, and how they have interpreted it. Also, because who wrote them. And who wrote them. Yeah. And that is a kinetic process. Absolutely. Often the way we are taught about these things in schools and colleges is like it's a static process. That once interpreted, it can never be changed. But it's a kinetic process and people get reinterpreted many of these things, isn't it? Absolutely. So, first of all, we are continuously finding new inscriptions uh, and new texts, not just inscriptions. There are also texts depending on the period you're looking at. And there's lots of material. And of course, yes, it, I mean, first of all, who translates it? What is the context of that translation? Uh, who wrote them? How much should we believe what is written? Because it's obviously written from the perspective of some king or somebody in, asked somebody to ins inscribe it. So just to give you an example, since we uh, were on the topic of Ashoka, we all, this belief of him becoming a pacifist is by and large based on an, an inscription uh, that is there in which he basically says that, you know, I went to Kalinga, I carried out these massacres, but I'm feeling very regretful and sorry about it. And this particular bit of inscription uh, is, of course, been replicated thousands of times in all our textbooks. That is the basis of that story. Now, there is a problem because, first of all, that inscription is totally not there in anywhere in Odisha. Now, if, if he was genuinely regretful, the one bunch of people he should be expressing this regret to is the Kalingans. But no, this inscription uh, is there in other places. In fact, uh, the main one is in fact uh, not even in India anymore, it's now in Pakistan. But in that same inscription, if you read the very next paragraph, he basically says, you forest tribes, 
if you do not behave yourself, then notwithstanding the remorse I am feeling for what I did to the people in Kalinga, I am going to do the same thing to you. So, as you can see, it's not just about interpretation, it's also about which bit of that inscription timeline. you have used, that which, tag which timeline you yeah, tagline and you have put where. You, if you literally read the next paragraph of the same inscription, you get a very different depression. Fascinating. Uh, let's come to this idea about why Indians and how Indians consider their nation. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Now, one of the things that I found out in, when I was writing or doing my research is this idea, where does this idea of India come from? And who invented this idea of India? Is there one idea of India or the ideas of India? Right? One of the things that came up is this idea that India, the construct called India, is a geographical construct. Yes. Right? In some ways, And yes. in this geographical construct is built, as Diana Eck, for instance, has mentioned, built on a palimpsest, so to speak, of pilgrimages. The footsteps of pilgrims, as, as among, she puts among it, other things, yes, right, has built the boundaries of this nation. Since you work with geography, I wanted to put that to you. This idea that the footsteps of pilgrims define the barriers of our nation or the boundaries of our nation. How far is that true, and what should we make of it today? So I think there are two issues here. One is um, India as a geographical space is very peculiarly, very well defined, actually. Um, you know, India is also a uh, geological, it's a, what is called a craton, it's a yeah. plate. Uh, so, um, it sort of drifted off from Africa and collided against the Indian, uh, against the Asian plate, causing the Himalayas to rise. So, in some ways, India is peculiar in also being a geo geographical uh, sort of subcontinent. Right. But I think in many ways, what we are really alluding to is the idea of India as a civilization and yeah. a civilizational nation. Uh, and I think that's very important because I think even in a lot of uh, li uh, literature, we hear, you know, India as a nation is a modern construct, really took off in 1947. And oddly enough, this is uh, an echo of a colonial idea, which for obvious reasons, the colonizers wanted to make the case that India did not have a sense of being it's a, a civilization or a nation in any way because obviously it served the purpose of them perpetuating their, their rule. But in fact, uh, Indians have had a sense of being a nation of some sort for a very, very long time. I mean, the Puranas clearly mention, uh, you know, the, it, south of the snowy mountains, the Himalayas, and north of the deep sea live the sons of Bharatam. So, mm. you know, you have that. You also have, for example, of course, you mentioned the crisscrossing of the... Um, of the pilgrimages. Of, of the pilgrimages. You also have character like Adi Shankaracharya who mm. crisscrosses the country and then he sets up muts. Mm. If you look at the location of the muts, they're not random. They are at four corners of the country. Mm. So there is very strongly a sense of a nationhood and the fact that it is somehow linked to a sacred geography as well. So this is a very old idea. Mm. Uh, and it's an idea that not only Indians considered themselves, but other rest of the world also accepted as being the case. I mean, uh, Columbus set sail not for South Asia, he set sail for India. Um, so there was this sense of others also, and going back to Herodotus, he clearly mentions this idea uh, as, a, as both a geographical and as a civilization and idea. Having said this, having said this, I would like to make two caveats. Okay. One is that this sense of this civilization has obviously evolved. It has accumulated many things from people who came both peacefully and as invaders. So it's an evolving idea. So it's not as if this has to hark back always to some pristine past, mm. number one. Number two, the exact contours of it also have changed. So just to give you an example, for much of history, uh, Indians traded a lot with Southeast Asia, say with Indonesia. And for much of history, Indians would have considered Indonesians and vice versa as being Indians. Mm. So if you read Indian texts, you never hear of the people of Southeast Asia being referred to as Mlechas, which is the word for barbarians, because they're a part of our civilization. Mm. Why is this interesting? Because, and it's something not just happening in history. 1949, the Indonesians throw out the Dutch 
and what do they do they name themselves after india as indonesia they name their currency the rupiah their national emblem is vishnu's garuda, uh, garuda. Yeah. Uh, their national carrier is also called garuda mm. um, and you know their president before last was meghavati sukarna putri so the point i'm making to you is this idea of a civilizational nation is a very old one and not some modern construct at all and has genuine uh, impact right to this day there's one point i wanted to bring in here which is that sometimes there is also an argument that this idea of a civilizational nation is in a sense a north indian idea it's an aryan idea so to speak and supposedly it's not a dravidian idea but one of the things that i came across and i want to put to you is if you read for instance dr bhandarkar's lectures okay you know dr bhandarkar gave these series of lectures in calcutta you know uh, uh, in the early part of the 19th century and he talks about how if you read indian history agastya hmm. the father of the tamil yeah agastya and even today in tamil nadu there is what the uh, the british called agastya's hill yeah. right the point where agastya crossed over from the north to the south right yeah. and agastya of course is the father of tamil grammar of the tamil language yes. right about how even there even in the transit of agastya hmm. this coterminous history this intermingling comes together and therefore this north south divide might not be as accurate as we sometimes are led to believe first of all i like to clarify that this first these terms aryan in uh, and dravidian need yeah. to be very carefully used yes uh, as i have written in my books more recently in my ocean of churn but also in the land of seven rivers that's right uh, this there is actually no evidence of any aryan invasion at all there never was oddly enough but now there's more than adequate genetic archaeological evidence that there no was no such thing uh, oddly enough there never was any in fact none of the vedas or anything mention any such invasion it was based on very weak um linguistic data which incidentally can be made to work both ways so so let's be very clear that the terms aryan and dravidian uh, are meaningless in this context the term aryan is never used in sanskrit literature to mean any ethnic group it largely means civilized which basically means everybody calls themselves aryan and their enemies are non aryan anyway that's a a uh, side issue as far as north and south india is concerned the genetic data is that the people who are what are called the ancestral south indians have been living in southern india for 30000 odd years and the ancestral north indians have been living in northern india again for some 20000 odd years and these two groups have been mis mixing and mingling for a long time other groups have also come particularly from southeast asia through the eastern route and we are a mixture of all of this over a very long period of time um of course that mixing mixing sped up around about 2000 bc with the collapse of the harappan civilization but this mixing has been going on for a long time and interestingly uh, it happens both ways there are clear movements of people moving upwards uh, it is not exactly the case that you know only northern culture moved downwards that is in, you know a british idea of invasion and conquest instead there are many things which move from south to north uh, iron technology for example clearly was found in southern india and made its way northwards uh, for example and this continuous mixing has happened to such an extent that there is nobody in india who is a pure ancestral north indian and there's nobody in india who is a pure ancestral south indian so this whole aryan dravidian debate is largely a pointless one so i want to make that absolutely clear but now that you've talked about agastya bringing so this idea of somebody from another part of the country coming and providing a uh, basis to a place's culture is very old so as i just mentioned uh, agastya who was clearly a northerner uh, according to the ancient tamils was the person who standardized the tamil language mm. and they didn't have a problem with that no um oddly enough modern tamils also don't have a problem with that after agastya all, muni i mean uh, after uh, all he i know but who is the, the sage, most yeah. most famous tamil today rajnikant he's actually a maratha as was the late jayalalitha who was not tamil at all so all of this has is been going on for a long long time this mixing and merging and in fact if you go back and read ocean of churn i talk about a southeast asian prince who comes to india Uh, in the 9th uh, century and becomes 
one of its uh, greatest kings, Nandi Varman II. And Nandi Varman II, if you go to, to one of his temples and you, in Kanchi and you look at his face, uh, he clearly is not uh, Tamil. He is a Southeast Asian. He looks like a Cambodian. So this merging and mixing is a very much a part of what Indian civilization is I made of. I just want to put in one, since we came up to the point of Rajnikanth and Jalalitha. Now, you know, see, like I said, some people say Jalalitha is originally from, from Kerala and this, that and the other. But one thing at least about her, whether she was Tamil or not and whatever, all that debate, one thing is clear, that she is certainly Brahmin hmm. leading a party which is quote-unquote anti-Brahmin. Hmm. So now I wanted to bring that to you now. Hmm. This whole thing about how caste plays out in geography, hmm. right? And also in history. And what do we make of the caste divide as it stands today with, in relation to the way we have seen caste or the Varna system uh, and the two things might be entirely different things in history and geography? So I'll take, tell you this answer from a genetic perspective. Right. Genetically, things are so mixed up yeah. that you can't take some random person, take his genes and guess his caste. Yeah. They are completely mixed up in all kinds of different ways. In fact, uh, as a species, we are not even pure human sapiens. Uh, there is more than adequate evidence that uh, you know, some 2 to 4 percent of everybody here uh, owes their genes to Neanderthals. Mm. Uh, and then there are other, uh, you know, other hominids like sometimes Denisov. Sometimes it really shows. And sometimes it shows in the way we drive our cars. Uh, then there are Denisovans and so on. Uh, and by the way, it's not only about North Indians, South Indians. There are people uh, like uh, coming in from the Eastern, uh, from what is now Laos, Cambodia and so on. So people like the Khasis, for example, are related to the Cambodians uh, and so on and so forth. There's a lot of mixing going on. And this has been the nature of things from the very beginning. So the idea of the Varna system being some sort of a racial segregation is not meaningful. Uh, Somebody genetically would be a Brahmin in one place and a Bheel uh, and a, you know, a tribal in another place. They are all mixed up anyway. But this, uh, this, this contradiction you mentioned about the politics yeah. uh, is uh, lovely because that this sort of thing has been going on for a very, very long time. Yeah. So just to give you an example, so uh, the, the, the uh, Placement of Buddhism at the center of Singhala nationalism yes. is oddly enough not done by the Sinhalese themselves, but by a 13th century um, uh, Indian, rather, Uriya uh, adventurer who captured the throne of Sri Lanka. Mm. And then, because he had very, very weak uh, sort of claim on the throne, it was he who cemented the relationship between. Uh, the throne, the Sinhalese throne and Buddhism. So uh, very often an outsider for completely different political reasons uh, ends up promoting something else. Uh, the Sinhalese kings themselves were much more uh, eclectic and uh, in fact there are, uh, there are clear mentions that the Sinhalese kings used to actually follow Vedic custom, not Buddhist customs. So this mixing and merging has been going on for a long time and the end result of all of that is all around you. Just look around you. There are people of every color, shape, size in India. Um, and that's all been the case for a long, long time. The other point that I wanted to ask you is that this India, of course, at least contemporary Indian history post-1947 has seen many um, you know, changes in its, not, not least the partition itself, but many changes in its geography. Yes. Right? And there are some who argue that Therefore, geography means nothing in India because it keeps changing. It's a shape-shifting monster, so to speak, right? But if there is no geography and if there is no validity to geography, then the nationhood itself, as some would argue, is questionable, right? So this connection again is, is a so matter it, of great is, debate. So the connection is fluid. Yeah. As I mentioned to you, there was a point in time Indians would have considered Indonesians as yeah. Indians. Uh, entirely validly. So yes, there is a civilizational idea of India and there is a geographical idea of India. Uh, and there is some, they are not exactly coterminous, but there is uh, obviously a link and you, you mentioned so, Diana X book. Yeah. But there, it is true of all kinds of, in different ways. And I'll give you one example how it can work out. For example, um, there are people in Vietnam, 30,000 odd people called the Chams who now, who are still Hindus, they follow Hinduism, and in their heads, when they die, 
Nandi comes and takes their soul and brings it to India, their holy land. So there is also the link of Hinduism to a holy land. It is also there in Buddhism. So it is all, there are many layers to this, which by the way is not even unique to us. Okay, there are many other civilizational nations and they also have a similar thing. I mean, uh, the Chinese uh, are also a civilizational nation. The exact contours of the boundaries of China are modern. Yeah. But their civilizational, I don't, their civilizational identity. identity and the idea of, of their, their themselves is a very old one. By the way, uh, this is also true of the Iranians. Mm. Um, they have always defined themselves in opposition to the people of um, what now we would call, uh, now have become the Sunnis. Mm. But there, if you go back to ancient times, there, there has been this clear who is on which side of the Tigris and their civilizational. So at some ancient times, they called themselves the Medes and the Persians and the other sides were the Azarians. And at some other time, they would have been the Byzantines versus the Persians. And today is the Shia versus the Sunni. But very much underlying all of this is an idea of who is inside the civilization and who is outside the civilization. Um, same thing happens with the Greeks. Uh, they spent all their time fighting each other, the Spartans versus the Athenians and so on. But they had a very strong sense of being Greek. Greek. Mm. Uh, every four years they stopped fighting and they went to the Olympics. Uh, every time the Persians turned up, they ganged up. So the fact that you have internal dissensions does not mean that there is no sense of identity. An, an identity. And that is very much uh, true of Indians too. I want to also to come to the you know, sort of a contemporary moment. But before that, I want to ask you one question. If you look at some of the great spiritual figures of India, whether it's Adi Shankaracharya, yeah. I found this out in the new book that I wrote on Vivekananda, Modern Monk. They seem to be intimately connected, not just with philosophy and theology, but also geography. Yes. Right? And they all take up these journeys, Adi Shankaracharya yes, yes. does, and in his footsteps, so does Vivekananda, yes. traversing through the length and breadth of the country. Yes. And they all sort of come back with this idea that that was a definitive moment in their own identity. Uh, absolutely. That by that travel, they're able to understand something they wouldn't have understood before. Yes. Right? So, so tell us something about this intimate connection between even the spiritual masters and geography. This is very much uh, there. You see, for example, Shankara cannot be understood unless you take into account the journey he made around the country. And then he established the mutts at the four corners. Yeah. Um, and then, of course, you mentioned Vivekananda does yeah. this, but so did Gandhi. Yeah. He That's comes right. back from uh, yeah. South Africa and he, he does this the... journey uh, yeah. to take an understanding of all of this. And so this is, that's why I said this. And all of these people had a very strong sense of uh, cultural nationhood yeah. and they do this repeatedly and by the way you can see this although in the Shakti Peet, the distribution of the Shakti Peets yeah. you have obviously the most easternmost ones in Assam yeah. um, with Kamakya and so on but then the westernmost part is Hingla Jamata in eastern Balochistan so again repeatedly you are seeing a certain uh, geography being um, marked out so to speak now the exact contours can change you can but there is clearly a core core geography that they are marking out. And so you see even in, for example, um, attempts by, for example, the Pandya, mm. the Cheras, the Cholas, in the southern tip of India, linking their own genealogies in various ways to the Mahabharat. Right. So there is this uh, continuous linkages that are being done, clearly with a clear consciousness of this wider civilization that is uh, shared. Let's come to the contemporary moment for a, for, mm. for a second. I come from Delhi, right? Mm. And even in the last sort of two decades roughly that I've spent in Delhi, mm. I've seen the geography of Delhi change. Absolutely. You know, yeah. We were just talking before the session began about Hoskar's village. Yeah. You know, and how it's sort of the metamorphosis, so to speak, of Hoskar's yeah. village. What happens when cities change like this? When they rediscover very old parts of their own sort of self and re-intertwine that into the contemporary moment. You know, London is a city that does that a yes, lot, right? Yes. It picks up all these old parts and then sort of reinvents them, um, you know, revamps them and makes them something new without often letting go of the old, which I find a very interesting Absolutely. process. So this is, this is an important part of, in fact, understanding India itself. Right. So India is a very ancient country. It's taking along all kinds of things along the way yeah. and adding new modernity on top of it. And it's the 
it is the complex interaction between the old, new, etc. that gives character to what is Indianness. So, Delhi is a good, good sort of uh, reflection of this. I mean, uh, we have done digs in um, uh, O Purana Kila yeah. and they are, you know, you have an Iron Age site there now. Yeah. Whether or not it is actually Indraprastha mentioned in the uh, Mahabharata or not, we can debate. But there is clearly a very ancient site there. And then you have the Rajput period, you have the Turkic period, Mughal period and so on. And at different places, if you drive around Delhi, you can see the different places. But it's not just that, uh, the imperial elements to it. There are also villages that are getting captured along the way. So, uh, I'll give you, I'll show you how this evolution happen, is happening real time. Um, let's take, for example, when the edge of Delhi say, moves into Gurgaon or some such area, what happens? There's typically an old village there. That village then doing farming and has some farmland and there is some sort of a village settlement. Now typically what will happen is that developer or government or whatever will move into that territory and they will take over the land. But the village settlement itself, it's called Lal Dora yeah. land and, they, uh, and that village settlement continues to be. The villagers, they get some compensation money but they continue to live in the village. Now, <clears throat> essentially what happens is the villagers, now that they don't have their farmland, now what do they do? They notice that in all the construction work that is happening around them, there are a whole bunch of workers, suppliers, there are people who are bringing in uh, cement and all these guys are coming into this new area, but they have nowhere to live. So mm -hmm. typically what happens, they use the compensation money and they build all kinds of structures in the old village and people come and begin settling in them. And over a period of time what happens is what used to be the village essentially becomes a slum with all the construction workers living there. I'm sure all of you have seen this happening. Now about a decade or so passes, by this time the construction around this area has begun to settle. Now what happens is that the construction workers move on to the next, wherever the next construction is happening. And you will have a new bunch of people moving to the uh, old village, slum, whatever you call it. Now these are typically uh, drivers, uh, uh, security guards, maids and so on. So now the character of that village changes again. There are more permanent people, there are more children because they tend to bring, unlike the construction workers, the maids and drivers bring in their children from the village. There are very often an Agarwal suites that turns up somewhere there. Um, then you will have some small school, English medium school at somebody's backyard and all of this happens. And again another 10-15 years or it passes. Now by this time, what has happened is that what was this old village is well inside the city and it's possibly next to some posh areas as well and some roads etc have been constructed. So now the place again goes through this transformation which is that it becomes you know uh, students begin living there, small offices turn up and so on and another decade or so passes and it begins to gentrify. Now fancy restaurants happen and so on. Now, I'll give you some examples of real places at various stages. So the last stage I mentioned where it gentrifies is like, you can say, is like Hoskas village. It's now become a happening hip place with expensive boutiques and so on. Uh, then you have Mahipalpur, which is sort of moving towards it. It's full of expensive uh, restaurants. But I remember it in the 1980s as a kid. Uh, it was a real village, as a proper village. It had actually had mustard growing there. And then some point in the late 80s, that land was taken up, uh, their land was taken away for making Vasant Kunj. And then it became a slum. And now it's gentrifying and becoming um, a, 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 a sort of a backpacker's rest uh, kind of place uh, with hotels sort and so on. Empur from my uh, Empur, yeah, it's become Empur. And then you have, of course, in Gurgaon, you have um, uh, Nathupur, which, uh, you know, is the place where uh, drivers, maids, etc. live today, uh, but I can tell you, given how close it is to a uh, uh, um, metro stop, uh, it will not remain in this uh, stage for too long. It is, uh, even before my eyes, it is rapidly gentrifying and this is the place where you'll find a lot of people from the northeast who are working in hotels, restaurants, they are beginning to live there. And so, in this fashion, the geography of the city is evolving. But also, so is the human geography. And so is the history. So is the history. So if you, for example, go to Mahipalpur and you go to some of these hotels and you talk to who uh, is the guy who is standing in front uh, uh, at the counter, 
he is very very likely the uh, first generation english speaking daughter or son of a migrant who moved there 30 years ago and the owner of that building or whatever is the grandson of one of the farmers who was living in mahipalpur so in this fashion not is what you're having is a completely new middle class is emerging uh, out of this whole churning process so this is live history of geography happening but it doesn't always geography and history doesn't only have to be about the grand buildings and red fort mahipalpur is also history of geography so urban renewal i mean you know to use yeah. a fancy term of what we describe as urban renewal. evolution yeah i would prefer i mean even when i first came to delhi i remember no auto wala would go jamuna par so to speak yeah now they now, all live there jamuna par is now one of the most expensive places in delhi you know mayur bihar has flats which is four crores and five crores and yeah. now you know this whole thing is i mean it and suddenly those those um, barapulla bridges have connected it to khan market yes so it's actually easier to get from mayur bihar to khan market today than to get from gk to khan market and yeah. and all of these sort of connections that you're talking about changes the dynamics of what kind of people live in that area absolutely what they want from that area the kind of restaurants that open there all of it so in fact let me give you an ancient example of this right so many of you have heard of the harappan city called dholavira right, right. now if you go to dholavira which i did just two weeks ago uh, it's uh, it's if you and you look at a map it's uh, marooned in the middle of salt flats mm. of uh, ran of kutch it's on an island it's, and if you go there there if you look in any direction there are these salt flats now why on earth would anybody build a town in the middle of salt flats there's nothing there horrible weather there's not enough water but in fact the reason it is there is that in fact it was a port hmm. now why was it a port the reason is that you see what is now the run of kutch was the estuary of both the saraswati river and of the indus both the indus and the saraswati is to flow into this what is now the run of kutch and if you had gone there 5000 years ago it would have looked more like the sundarbans and what happens is that of course the saraswati river begins to dry up from about 3000 bc and by 2000 bc it completely dries up uh, and at some point the indus slowly begins to float outward um and possibly because of tectonic movements that area begins to is pushed up so what happens is what was uh, essentially like the sundarbans an estuary area uh, dries up and becomes salt flats and it maroons this island and this city called dholavira in the middle of nowhere so this evolution <coughs> of geography you can clearly see and you can see that when you visit it so you'll see this fairly large city on this island and there's clearly a phase in which it is very well functioning and then suddenly all of a sudden maybe around about 2000 bc there is a drop and you can see a breakdown uh the buildings are no longer better there is possibly an earthquake because some parts of the walls have moved uh and then further another few hundred years later the settlements are clearly become village settlements which are inside the urban landscape so this so i described here mahipalpur which was sort of a gentrification here is an example of ruralification happening uh 2000 years ago uh, sorry 4000 years ago fascinating We have about roughly 15 minutes uh, left on this session, so I think now is the time to open it up yeah. and take questions. So, if there's anybody who wants, uh, the gentleman there, yes, go ahead. Can somebody give a microphone to him? We'll just come to you, sir. Give us a moment. Yes, go ahead. Can you hear me? Yes. So, I'll take you right at the beginning of the conversation. Which you okay, just one second before you take us anywhere. I just want to establish the rules of this. Please ask questions. Short, succinct questions so that we can reply in short, succinct ways so that more people get a chance. If you have a comment, you can talk to Sanjeev later, but here at least please ask a short question. Yeah. Yes, now. Yeah. It's a succinct question which Lovely. is right at the beginning of the conversation. Okay, perfect. Uh you spoke of Kalinga right at the beginning. Louder. Kalinga. Yeah. You spoke about. So I want to know in your opinion when was it when uh, ashoka really became a pacifist that's question 1 the question 2 is the icsc days uh, of history 
uh, had it been written the way you've written or have you spoken, probably a lot more historians and people actually following geography would have been sitting amidst us. You have to be a little louder at the last bit of the question. What was the last part? I, I also didn't get it. So ICSE history, the way it was written, it was so boring. And it was having a colonial probably flavors to it because it was a generalized history to just uh, capture sort of ethnicities of India, right? Uh, what in your opinion, therefore, an ICSE or NCRT should do probably in this generation to make books uh, more uh, interesting more interesting and making more of historians and geography right. uh, readers. Okay, so let me answer right in the beginning. Uh, I, have, I am not convinced at all that Ashoka ever became a pacifist. He was most likely a mass murderer right to the end. Most of the inscriptions you are reading is basically propaganda. Uh, added on with Nehruvian propaganda of the 20th century. With the fact, people do not realize that in the Indian tradition, uh, Ashoka is not considered a great king at all. It is Chanakya and Chandra, uh, Chandragupta who are considered the great kings in the Indian tradition. His elevation, his rediscovery is a 19th century British uh, colonial effort. But his elevation to being the great is a 20th century uh, thing. So I am, I as a, you know, you can, I can go on about it, but there's more than adequate evidence of him doing nasty things well into his uh, old age. And of course, in his own lifetime, his empire began to collapse. Even mainstream historians accept this. So that's one part of it. The second part of it is, there are many ways to make Indian history more interesting. First of all, <coughs> the history of India has got to stop to be the history of Delhi. You know? The, there are la you, you read the history of India, it's all about obscure dynasties. Some of them important dynasties, Mughals were certainly important. But the Lodhis, I'm sorry, were basically ruling a tiny kingdom in and around Delhi. Not important. Vijayanagar Empire, the Chola Empire, the homes of Assam, far more important, but you have completely edited them out, completely out of our history books. So this is important part. So, so one is to get the rest of India back into our history. Secondly, history is not only the history of uh, political history, that this dynasty came and that king came. There are other ways of thinking of history. There is, as I said, one example, history of geography, how cities evolve. I mean, there's very interesting things to be said about how Delhi alone evolved. If you want to be about Delhi, you can also talk about that. Or how Bombay, uh, Jaipur, very interesting histories of that. So that is another history of science. There's some incredibly interesting things that ancient Indians did uh, without having to get into the business of flying chariots. There's enough to be said about ancient Indian history, which is again not talked about. So we need to put all of this in there, but I will add one important fact. All of this has to be based on proper evidence. And this evidence is continuously evolving. It's not that just because Cunningham dug up something in the 19th century, that is the only evidence. We have continuous addition of evidence, new archaeology is being found, new genetics, uh, climate sciences, new texts that are being found. This history has to be consequently, continuously added to. And unfortunately, because it has become politically inconvenient uh, for the narrative, much of this new evidence, uh, it is simply ignored. This is absolutely absurd. So I think these are the various things that we need to uh, do. Okay, there's a lady there. The other thing is we'll try and take roughly 50% of the questions from women and 50% from men. You know, we don't want another version of man, man questioning here, right? You know, like man spilling. Yes, uh, lady. Do we have any idea of um, what the Indian culture was like before the land uh, uh, banged into the uh, Asian... Um, so, so here you have to be very careful about geological time and human time scales. <clears throat> the Indian plate banged into the European, uh, into the Asian plate 55 million years ago. Okay, this is a long time before human beings existed. We as a species have existed only for 200,000 years. Uh, we left Africa 60,000 years ago. Um, uh, people who may be our ancestors perhaps began to settle in this general area 30,000 odd years ago. Uh, and things that can be vaguely have links to Indian civilization, which could be maybe in Neolithic times or so, or seven, eight thousand years ago. So these are completely different time scales. So do not confuse the two. The geography of India, therefore, has a much older history than human history. 
but of course they interact with each other um, just because the geology uh, this old geology happened in ancient times doesn't mean it stopped happening today uh, the coastline you see around us is uh, changed many times in human uh, being uh, seeing it I just mentioned of course Dholavira which is now marooned in the inland whereas in fact it was a port uh, but but you know um, uh, till say seven eight thousand years ago uh, Sri Lanka was attached to India um, and in fact uh, the, the, at the end of the last ice age between uh, 14,000 years ago to the uh, 8,000 years ago uh, there was continuous flooding of the coastlines because uh, of the uh, ice was melting and coastlines were being flooded and interestingly all ancient civilizations have a myth of the flood there's the flood of Noah mm. which is there in the Middle East but we also have a flood of the myth the, the story of Manu and mm. Matsya Avatar similar stories that aboriginals have in Australia similar stories there with the Laotians and so on all ancient civilizations have a story of the myth so one could argue I'm not sure but one could argue in on this evidence that possibly this is a folk memory of the period of flooding so the point I'm making to you is this business of the plate coming from Africa and banging into uh, into Asia is much before human beings existed but that does not mean that the geography we are seeing in human time scales is also not changing that too is happening the gentleman uh, there yes sir yeah, go uh, ahead yeah Sanjeev I have a question you spoke sorry about, I, yeah. I don't know where I'm looking yeah yeah yeah, 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 ah, yeah, okay. yeah, yeah okay you spoke about us evolution of uh, caste etc immigration economic development on the history of geography what about the impact of language religion creed etc on the history of geography Absolutely. So there's been a lot of churning going on um, and one of the interesting things is that uh, history and geography and culture are in fact my theory of uh, history which I write about not in the book we are discussing right now but in the ocean of churn is that in fact you cannot uh, it's something called complex adaptive systems. Now what is a complex adaptive what is complexity the basic point of this is that you cannot think of the world by stripping out any individual bit it's about culture individuals large geological factors uh, environment all of them interacting with each other and so religion is certainly an important part of this language is certainly an important part of this but what is important here to understand from a complexity perspective is that you cannot strip out any bit and say 20% influence comes from geography 5% from language that would completely miss the point because all of these things are interacting with each other in very multiple ways and so for example I'll give you one example of how religion or culture can remember both history and geography okay now there is a tr when Kum Mela happens what happens there is a it happens in Lahabad in Allahabad the Ganga and Yamuna are clearly meeting but it's supposed to be the meeting of three rivers the third river being Saraswati now there's no evidence of this Saraswati flowing underground so what are they talking about now if you go back and look at the ancient texts and now geological surveys etc it's quite clear that the Saraswati existed before 2000 BC and it is the dry riverbed of the Ghaggar and that when this river dried up uh, the Harappan civilization collapsed and many of these people from those cities moved on to the Gangetic Plains so what is happening essentially is at least in my view is that these people then move on to the Gangetic Plains uh, but they remember that they came from the Saraswati so they transfer their memory of this of where their civilization started and they transfer it to this spot where the Yamuna and the Ganga meet and every 12 years they go there and they remember that, that's where the civilization came from now this doesn't just happen in ancient times this happens in very modern times and I'll show you how this happens again now people from Eastern UP and Bihar in the 19th century then went to Mauritius right so when they went to Mauritius they had a memory of Ganga just like the people moving from Harappan cities had a memory of Saraswati so what did they do they basically took a ghada worth of Ganga Jal and took it to Mauritius and poured it into a lake and they renamed the lake Ganga Talao and so basically they treat that lake Ganga Talao 
as the Ganga. So what is happening? There is, this is a link, both of history, geography, religion, culture, culture and memories of a people. As they're moving around, they're taking this. So geography is not just about the physical landscape. It has a lot to do with the meaning we attribute to it. Fascinating. Okay, like I said, we'll divide this. The lady there, the gentleman there, and then the lady. Go ahead, ma'am. You hear me? Okay. Yes. yes. Uh, so while interpreting history, how do you discern between uh, a court-sponsored historian who is more likely to praise the king and more likely to uh, uh, change the geography to suit his uh, story and a genuine author who's just narrating facts? Very difficult to do. Very often, especially when you're taking old medieval or ancient history, unless you have three, four different people and you know, the, the, the inscription by this king is not contradicted by the inscription of another king, very difficult to do. So that is why you have to take this evidence with many pinches of salt. So that is one very important thing. Unfortunately, historians write as if they actually know what went on. But in fact, they are at best guessing uh, from random facts and figures and extrapolating the, the, them. And this is one of the things I keep making a point about, that it is very important to spend time and make, rather than telling the narration, but to make explicit what is the evidence and how you have dealt with it. And in fact, there are many different ways of interpreting the same evidence. And when I make this point, people say, yeah, but you know, uh, <clears throat> what will happen if the textbook suggests too many different views? But actually, that's OK. I mean, you watch television every day. We can't even decide, we can't even agree on what happened yesterday. How do you get historians to agree on what happened 2,000 years ago? It is OK that different views based on good evidence, but different views are allowed to be, as long as there's some reasonable basis and evidence, uh, they should be allowed to flourish. Gentlemen there, yes, go ahead, sir. Hello. In Ramayana, it is said that there was a bridge between India and Sri Lanka. Is there any evidence that the bridge was there? Or these kind of some stones were found there, they may float there, please. Okay, okay. So, so one of the important things to realize is, that we have to uh, separate the geography from the events mentioned in the <coughs> Ramayana. <coughs> now this, there is a, uh, many of the, uh, much of the geography mentioned in the Ramayana is real. Um, and uh, that does not mean the events are real because even if it's completely fiction, even modern fiction writers take a real landscape and mention it. But the geography, has many elements which seem to be real. I mean, if you go, Kishkinda, for example, is the where, you know, you mentioned, talk about uh, the kingdom of the monkeys. If we actually visit Kishkinda, which is in Karnataka, right across, by the way, from Humpy. the Hampi, mm. it's actually a landscape of rocks, and there are lots of monkeys, there are actually caves there, uh, there is a sloth bear a sanctuary next door, which if you remember, Jambavan. So it's exactly the landscape that comes out of Valmiki's version of the Ramayana. Now, how on earth somebody sitting in northern India knew about this landscape, you know, we can debate. Maybe he heard about it, maybe he personally visited it. Similarly, in Rameshwaram, if you go to Dhanushkoti, there it actually is a series of sandbars which connect through to um, uh, Sri Lanka. That actually exists. Don't take my word on it. Look up Google Earth uh, and you'll be able to see the sandbar links between North India and Dhanushkoti. So, this is a there is a, some geological feature genuinely there. Now, whether it links through to the story being real or not, or did, did in some ancient time some army use those sandbars to cross, the, cross to Sri Lanka, who knows. Uh, but the, those sandbars are there. And don't take my word for it. You can actually Google uh, maps will show it to you clearly in the satellite. If you take the satellite option, it clearly shows it to you. So, I think there's one small thing to mention here. And, you know, we mentioned D.R. Bhandarkar and he spoke uh. about this. This question often comes up, are our epics to be considered fact or are they only myth? All these conversations we constantly have and there are actually very learned people have given us answers to this. I mean, if you read the Bhandarkar lectures, for instance, he's very clear, like Ishq Bahu, for instance, you know, okay. our common friend Amish has just written about that in yeah. a fiction. The clan of Ishq Bahu from where Ram comes from exists. 
Yeah. Now you could argue whether that had a king called Ram or not, or all of that is sure. I mean, some there will be some conjecture there. But there is an Ishkvaku clan that is not clear, debated clear, at all. Yeah, clearly exists because Absolutely there no are debate. even into historical times, the later yeah. uh, king lists in the Puranas mention the Ikshvakus well after the Iron Age, so That's into right. historical times. So and all of these yeah. things, I mean, you know, like you mentioned about the the you know the Setu. There is an, uh, in, our, in our collective memory, there is an Ayodhya. Now you can say whether it was here, whether it was there, 100 kilometers here, all of that. There is a Dwarka, there is a Kashi, there is a civilizational memory of all these places. places. And they seem to really resemble many of the things we read in our myths, in actual figures. Like those places exist, the memory of those places exist. Now you can debate whether this person actually went there or not, and whether he had a bow and an arrow which flew here or not, or there or not. All that is, I mean, you know, there's yeah. some storytelling there, clearly. But the geography, every, the geography of it, exists. Of it yeah. largely exists, yeah. yes. Yes, Malika. The microphone is not working. Can somebody give her another microphone? Ah, there you ah, go. Okay. Um, uh, thanks, Hindol and Sanjeev, for a very interesting talk. One of the points I found particularly interesting was uh, the idea that history depends on who wrote it, and particularly you know, so as Hindol knows, I'm working on this partition museum where we're trying to tell the history of partition through the experiences of people. And as, I was wondering, as you look back and have been doing all your research, um, what people's voices might be missing, and particularly women? Like, are women as a group missing from a lot of the historical texts you've been looking at? And how has that impacted our understanding of what their lives and experiences might have looked like? So, um, absolutely, history depends on who writes it. And there is, uh, you know, like I, I make this explicit, by the way, in my more recent book called Ocean of Churn, where I have attempted to do both these things. One is I have talked about uh, in, um, uh, in the history of the Indian Ocean from the perspective of the people of the Indian Ocean, being one myself. Uh, whereas yes. much of this history of the Indian Ocean is almost always yeah. written from a Western perspective. And consequently, you get a perfunctory chapter about the spice trade or something in the beginning. But really, the history gets going when Vasco de Gama turns up, as if the rest of us were sitting around twiddling our thumbs till he turned up. And of course, that history then ends when the British leave, as if after they left, nothing particularly interesting happens. So if you look at my writing on the Yushan of Churn, I specifically go on to talk about Mandela and Lee Kuan Yew and, 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 and Bombay in, in modern times and so on. That's one point of it. One doesn't have to, by doing this, I'm not blaming the Westerners. They're entirely valid to write history from the Western perspective. My problem is that we then accept it as being the only history. It is our laziness that we have not written our own history. So that's one point. Excellent. The gentleman there, no, go no, ahead. I want to finish her oh, second point. Okay, yes, fine. the point about women. I absolutely agree that women have, have been sort of cut out of much of history. But this is not because of a lack of evidence. Let me tell you that. There is actually a lot of interesting stuff that women did, particularly in India and in Southeast Asia, where, by the way, in many parts, the <coughs> dynasties were actually matrilineal. Hmm. So, in fact, um, uh, I specifically talk about matrilineal uh, dynasties and how there were these amazing uh, history of, say, the Angkor or the Chams were matrilineal. Uh, there were great queens uh, in the Indian Ocean world, uh, in India and elsewhere. Uh, and they, there are many of them are still remembered in folk memory. Um, so, at the, the, un oddly enough, you know, the, 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 take for example this a series of three queens called Abakka. Hmm. Uh, the first of them was Queen, Queen, Queen Abakka, who led this extremely uh, what should I, resistance against the Portuguese uh, over three generations. Uh, and she is very much remembered in the west coast of India in the local dance dramas and Yakshagan and all these kind of things. But historians have nothing to say about it. So oddly enough, when I was writing about this in my book, I had to deal with a few odd scraps of information coming from journalists and so on. At least in English, there is no history of these three remarkable queens. 
Okay, I'm, a, I'm sorry, <laughs> this is, it's a pity, but we've completely run out of time. However, what you can do is, Sanjeev will be signing copies. You can catch him there at the place where authors sign where copies. Where is that? Sorry. Uh, one of the organizers will take you there. Okay. Okay. So it's somewhere so, there. It's somewhere there. Okay. Please join him there, get your copies, ask him questions. But as of now, we've completely run out of time. A huge round of applause to Sanjeev. Thank you. Wonderful work. Thank you very much for being with us. Thank you. It was